people take a lot of food across the globe, sometimes are different, uh, spiders, snakes, and also that, that's a shop that I, I believe that you've never seen. It's an animal head cook shop. So basically, uh, it's just uh, preparing the head of the, and it's very expensive. So what is the foodborne disease? Uh, are the diseases which are related to ingestion of food, microbial, viral, and chemical. And the burden is actually based on the prevalence, incidence, morbidity, mortality, uh, which is being calculated. It could also be related to finance as well. Food seems fresh, but are they safe? It's, it's another question. Food have a lot of uh, international dimensions as well. If we look at the, if we re remap the world based on the weight and underweight uh, children, then we see that North America is, uh, the underweight cases are very few, but in Africa, in Asia, in India, underweight people uh, are a lot, children are a lot. Food aid is also another issue. Uh, the more uh, affluent countries are usually giving uh, food aid, and this is from North America and Europe mainly. These are the publication that in the past uh, 10 years have come up of this group. Uh, the methodology that has been used was a syndromic and etiologic agent. So based on diseases that have been reported in the literature, in addition to the laboratory tests that were available in other places. Whenever the data was not available, it had been estimated based on the nearest countries. In this study, 31 foodborne hazards have been studied. Among them are three chemicals uh, and uh, peanut allergies, which, which uh, totally are four. The chemicals that have been uh, studied are aflatoxin, dioxin, and cyanide in cassava, uh, in addition to peanut allergies. In Canada, we don't have uh, cyanide in cassava in food, uh, but it's the food of 200 million people in Africa. Uh, it's the disease uh, of the poor of the poor. So uh, on top of acute toxicity, there is a disease which is called Konzo. Uh, they cannot walk. When they, when they walk, uh, they gate. Uh, so it's a bit, uh, uh, the burden is high, but it's related to consuming cassava and the poor preparation of cassava. Peanut allergy. It's, it's amazing that uh, peanut allergy, in my personal view, was a disease for Europeans and North Americans. I practice medicine in many countries, at least in three countries, and uh, many countries do not have, I've never heard of uh, peanut allergy in some part of the world. The result has shown that, but in North America, is up to 1% of the population are peanut allergy. Uh, the other toxin was dioxin. Dioxin is mainly industrial, and uh, it causes some uh, health issues, including on uh, hypothyroidism, and also decreasing the uh, count of sperm, uh, uh, sperm cell counts. According to WHO, if the sperm count decreases, it's not a disease, uh, and the burden cannot be measured. But if it decreases to less than 20,000, it's now a disease. So if dioxin, the way that it has been calculated, is that if dioxin shifts the sperm count, some population which are below, which are just above the 20,000 will be shifted to below. And that population are considered to be the, uh, the disease, which are the result of dioxin. It's very similar uh, the way that IQ and lead has been calculated. When, when the lead goes up, then the po population IQ will be shifted towards lower, but below 70 is a disease. So the people who are between 70 and 72.5 will be shifted as a result of uh, lead to, uh, to the disease state. Aflatoxin B1, B2, uh, and M1, M2 in milk. So uh, may cause the most important uh, part uh, of my talk is actually the liver diseases, uh, hepatocell carcinoma, as a result of exposure to aflatoxin. Uh, 
for some reasons, I have to show the result based on uh, radar because there are a lot of uh, overlay. Very easily, this one shows uh, the number of illnesses for aflatoxin, cyanide dioxin, and peanut allergen. Uh, so I, I was trying to show which one of these four were more common. So peanut allergen and dioxin are by a, by a magnitude of one and uh, order of magnitude of two more uh, common in terms of presenting with illnesses. Here we have the previous slide. On top of that, the number of deaths and the dollies. So the red triangle uh, sh uh, shows that aflatoxin is highly fatal in these four. But there is no case of death reported as a result of exposure to dioxin. Taking these two into account, the foodborne illnesses as well as the deaths, the dollies show a, a, the, the blue part, which is more or less more common in dioxin and peanut allergen aflatoxin, but less common, uh, less massive in cyanide exposure. Uh, so we've shown the dolly related to four chemicals. Also, they are different in different parts of the world. Uh, at the moment, WHO has changed, I mean, in the past couple of years, the geographical areas. Um, we will talk about the China in, in this talk a lot. China is not considered to be uh, Eastern, uh, East Asia anymore. They consider it as the Western Pacific region with Australia. As far as I remember, the West is moving from the Europe to the United States. Now it's moving towards the, the China. This is the result for these areas. If you look at the radar, it's African, American, East Mediterranean, European, South Asian, and uh, West Pacific, or China. China, India, which are the most important part uh, or in, of this, this, this talk. This is the overall uh, burden of disease. I'll go back to this slide later on. If you look at the cassava alone, it's a disease for <coughs> Africa. No other part of the world uh, experience the diseases are coming out of uh, cyanide related to cassava. There are some cases reported from India, <coughs> but uh, not common. For the other one is the dioxin. The burden is uh, shifted towards the South Asia, towards India by far, and some in Eastern Mediterranean, but not other parts. So the immigrants, new Canadians who are coming here, they have been exposed to dioxin a lot before their arrival to BC. If you look for aflatoxin, uh, you know that there are four uh, categories in the radar. The dotted line is the average in the world. The blue part is the dolly related to aflatoxin. As can be seen, in West uh, Pacific, China, and Africa, by far, followed by uh, India, the dolly is higher related to aflatoxin. So it's, it could be the case for uh, the immigrants who are coming here. For peanut allergy, it, it's a very a, a different story. It's common in America, Europe, and uh, West Pacific. Probably it's as a result of uh, Australia. Putting these four uh, chemicals to each other, the burden for uh, South Asian, West Pacific, and African is far more than the uh, other group. I couldn't put a picture for uh, American, but that's the whole point of this study. So I wrote the BCCDC uh, to, to go back to it uh, again. The question is, which picture we have to put there for, for the American area? At the moment, at the moment, we are assuming that there is no aflatoxin here. So there is no disease related to that. But there are people who are coming here from China who have been exposed for 30 years to very high level of uh, aflatoxin. They will bring some disease with them or so some condition that I will go back to that. 27.5% of BC population are uh, immigrants at the moment. So in BC, we have newcomers who are coming from different regions of the world. Data for them are available and uh, we may use the uh, internationally 
provided data which are freely available and, and reliable for the immigrants who are coming from that part of the world. Uh, if you are going to study in future Canadian from Chinese origin or from uh, Indian origin, the sample size for the studies related to chemical uh, disease, ch chemical foodborne disease would be high and probably not practical. Uh, you're familiar with this in, in uh, environmental health services, so we have the source to the endpoint and path. The endpoints uh, in toxicology are a bit different. I will get back to it. The endpoints could be acute, subacute, chronic, or even delayed. For 30 years, there is nothing, and then after 30 years, 30 years it might happen. At the moment, uh, so aflatoxin via the nuts can induce uh, hepatocell carcinoma. If that happens, we need to do the uh, health, human health risk assessment. But in Canada, we don't have aflatoxin, so the pathway is impaired. So there is apparently there is no need to do any uh, human health risk assessment regarding to aflatoxin and hepatocell carcinoma. Hepatocell carcinoma is a very fatal uh, liver cancer. It's not common in the North America, but uh, the 50 percent survival is below one year. So it's it's a rapid killer. This is the a summary of the different areas from Africa to West Pacific, uh, and aflatoxin, cyanide, dioxin, and peanut allergen. As can be seen from African immigrants in BC, their uh, exposure to aflatoxin and cyanide are, are a lot. For European, the peanut allergy uh, is a lot, and for South Asian, the dioxin exposure. This is the previous slide on top of the disease that could come out of them. So for African, uh, uh, African immigrants, probably cancer related to aflatoxin or conzo, it, it is probably not common. And for South Asian, cancer and decrease in sperm count. So these people are more prone to that disease. This slide is from some of my previous patients. Uh, after 25 years of uh, exposure to chemicals, high doses of chemicals, uh, as a chemical warfare agent. And after 25 years, there was no uh, problem during this period for him. And then he came with lymphoma. Oh, this example is an exaggerated one, but it does show that the toxicology is uh, acting rather differently from the other parts. This lady have, let's say, have uh, back pain due to osteoporosis in 2015. But if we go back uh, to uh, 1965, the great-grandmother was exposed to organophosphate, so she was pregnant. Her child is not capable of developing glands. Then the, the grandchild uh, would not receive enough uh, milk and probably will lead to uh, osteoporosis. So basically, osteoporosis in 2015, in an exaggerated Example could be attributed to something which happened in uh, 1965. It's a long-term issue. At the moment, uh, we say that in Canada and the USA, the aflatoxin exposure is 0 0.2. The, in China, it's 17, which is 100 times more or less higher. As a result of this data, uh, the conclusion by the health uh, authorities is that uh, hepatocell carcinoma attributed to aflatoxin in North America is extremely rare. Is extremely rare, but for China, up to five percent of them could be related to uh, aflatoxin. In terms of the, uh, there is a lag between exposure. I've developed a graph here to show what I mean. Here is uh, the dose. On top of it is the duration of exposure. So what is happening is that uh, toxicology endpoints are related to uh, time as well as the dose. Mainly is, is like that. So when the dose goes up, the biologic biomarkers may change. We don't see any, any effect. And if it goes higher, the percentage of people will show that uh, will be more prevalent. Biomarkers 
changing, but uh, there is no clinical or subclinical. In later stages, subclinical issues may, might, might happen. And uh, later or, or with a higher dose, clinical effects and deaths in the same pattern may, 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 may happen in the cases. So a person could be exposed in, in China 20 years ago. The biomarkers might have changed. And here, uh, although he's not exposed, he, he might show some effects. This is also basically another way of showing that. So we have aflatoxin levels at the left and at the right, the uh, percentage of hepatocell carcinoma that could be attributed to uh, aflatoxin. So in person who, who, who was born and lived in DC, the exposure is very low. The attribution is very low as a result. But a person who, have, who has lived in China, let's say, or, or South Asia, they have been exposed. At this point, when he immigrates to Canada, the ex uh, exposure comes down. But the question is the human health assessment will probably might be this one or might be that one. And if biomarkers have changed previously, that could be the first one. Let's play with the data. If uh, that happens uh, in the population of the world, we have around 19,000 deaths as a result of per year in 2010 as a result of these four chemical exposure. For BC, if BC was a similar to the world, it was 13 deaths and 222 uh, uh, diseases. But just for 27 persons who are immigrants, who are probably representative of the world, uh, we will have 61 and probably four deaths per year uh, in this quarter of the population of BC. Uh, I also, just to show how much important are the chemicals, I compare them to uh, pathogens. Uh, this graph is a bit exaggerated because the rate have been multiplied by 100. Actually, the base was the norovirus, which is common. Uh, so divided, the number was divided by the number of norovirus and multiplied by 100. So if you do that, you see that uh, the number of diseases by toxic, uh, the toxic exposures are not a hot, hot, high, but the number of deaths are coming up. So for aflatoxin deaths, which is the, the multiplication by 100, so it's more or less the same as major uh, pathogens. Um, if we look at the number of illness for six major diarrheal disease uh, in Canada, uh, in comparison to chemicals, we don't see a lot of uh, diseases, these are illnesses, but uh, uh, an estimation of the quarter of the population uh, will give to, uh, for, for whole Canada, would be around 26 deaths per year, which is, which is a lot. So this is a previous slide. We don't have aflatoxin not to do the uh, human health risk assessment. But the truth is, although the aflatoxin and dioxin and the, the rest are not a problem here, but uh, in terms of food safety, but they are a problem for human health. Uh, the conclusions, uh, one is the 27% the, the of the population of BC are probably more represented by the data derived from international for WHO in comparison to the, uh, who peop who, the people who was born here in terms of chemical food exposure. Uh, that's probably the case. Foodborne diseases are not a matter of, uh, chemical foodborne diseases are not a matter of food safety, but it's still a matter of uh, human health. They should receive more attention, or perhaps as equal as, if they are as equal, uh, fatal as uh, the pathogens, uh, they should have received the same information. Uh, new Canadians are coming from different parts of the world, so they are exposed. They are not exposed at the moment, but uh, you know, for uh, hepatotoxic uh, hepatocellular carcinoma might happen as their previous exposure. There are some steps that we can take into account because it has been shown that 
HBS antigen, HB, uh, hepatitis B uh, could be uh, magnifying the, could have synergistic effect with uh, the effect of uh, aflatoxin. So if that's the case, let's say, I, I put this for discussion and looking forward for the views of uh, yours to see is, is, is it a good way of approaching this. Uh, these are the ones that have been already uh, suggested by uh, some uh, uh, papers that can be done. So for the new com uh, commerce from uh, West Pacific region, China, at least we can contact the physicians to let them know that they are still at risk of uh, chemical uh, effects. And there could be some diet advising, screening could happen for them, uh, and even uh, hepatitis uh, B vaccine. I emphasize on, on this part as well because it's something that is being done uh, currently. Uh, I put the red runs as a matter of for discussion. At the moment, based on the BC regulations, all newcomers below age of 12 uh, from the hepatitis B uh, prevalent areas, such as Asia and Africa, are being provided by HBS antigen, uh, HBS vaccine uh, freely. Indi individuals with uh, this could be extended for high aflatoxin exposed, which are probably the same areas. Also, individuals with chronic liver disease are receiving uh, the vaccine freely. Uh, it could be uh, extended for long time uh, aflatoxin exposure. Uh, persons at the moment, persons visiting uh, high HPV endemic areas and they stay there for more than six months, they are recommended to have HPS uh, vaccine, uh, but it's not provided freely. Uh, also, communities in which uh, HPV is highly endemic, uh, they are recommended but not provided. So, in these two areas, we also can think of uh, aflatoxin as well. The people who are coming from uh, India and South Asia region, uh, we also could give some information in regard to the hypothyroidism as well as uh, for a low sperm count. The, uh, I, the a letter that, okay, okay. This is very large, but it's not working apparently <laughs> the, the, way, the, the way that it is expected. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I used to talk without, without a microphone because my sound is genetically uh, high enough, but it's not working at the moment. So, uh, uh, writing a letter to physicians uh, in regard to the concurrent problems that they, they might have alcohol use and occupation, tobacco smoking for preventing a lower uh, uh, problem related to lower uh, sperm count. Uh, health policy decision making could and perhaps should customize uh, for uh, newcomers. At the moment, we are running the issue for chemical foodborne diseases, uh, similar to the people who were born here. Probably, uh, it could be a better uh, indicator of using international data from the uh, WHO or the countries of origin uh, to see how, how at risk they could be. I would like to thank the people who were participating in uh, early part of this talk, that, that's the, the Fergus study, uh, in particular, uh, uh, Herman Gibb, uh, and also a special thank to Tom, because uh, he, he read this and made a, made a lot of uh, input in it. The raw data for the early part that I showed uh, are available and online and can be accessed. Thank you. Thank you, Reza, for the presentation. Do we, uh, we'll start with questions in the room. Do you, are there any questions from the room? And could you come up to the podium to talk into the microphone? Um, if you could come up here to talk in the microphone with the people so they could hear you from online. Oh, 
around 33 people are online. Yeah. Yeah, so thanks for this, Reza, and um, it's good to see more stuff coming out of the Global Burden of Diseases study. Um, I'm going to challenge one of your assertions and then maybe challenge myself um, uh, on it. Um, you said about, uh, about two-thirds of the way through that maybe in BC these um, chemical uh, foodborne problems need as much attention as the microbial one. And this was after having talked about a very low um, uh, burden of disease when we know that we've got dozens of cases of salmonella and listeria, um, meningitis and septicemia, uh, the occasional death, but that viral um, gastroenteritis is a major cause of dehydration in children and hospitalization. So just on the magnitude, um, I, I'm not sure if that quite fits. Uh, but on the other hand, these are four markers that were chosen by WHO for this story, and they may not be the optimal ones for our ecosystem. I mean, don't, aren't, isn't it possible that we've got other foodborne intoxications and poisonings that are much more important than these in BC? Um, and if we did a local risk assessment, do you think we'd have a different answer? First of all, I agree with your comments that uh, <coughs> the burden of Pathogens is by far, not by far, it's higher than the chemical foodborne diseases. Uh, as for the selected uh, chemicals, it has been discussed a lot. WHO has a very uh, strict rules in including two burden of disease. Let's say if the number of cases are below 1,000 per year globally, they will not include it. Or uh, if the endpoint is not clear, of the, uh, or if there is a problem, but uh, the burden cannot be included. So it has been a matter of discussion for a long time, and eventually some of them have been uh, dropped out, uh, such as uh, or, uh, organophosphorus uh, compounds in food, and in addition to lead, for example. Uh, it, it's not here. So uh, there were some agreements on that, but certainly it's not complete. It, it would be uh, expanded in future, hopefully. And at least this one shows uh, these four chemicals could be uh, could, could impact. The size of impact is not as large as the microbial ones, but in terms of the number of estimated number of deaths, it is more or less similar to the pathogens. If if that the assumptions that I've made are correct, if not, I mean that's that's not the. Thanks, Reza. So, as you said, we're living in a global world, and uh, we need to take account of people's exposures before they came here, who are newly arrived in Canada. But the other part of the global world is that we're being exposed in Canada to many of the agents that led to people's harmful exposures in their countries of origin. So, I wonder if you would comment on the availability of foods that people eight when they were in their countries of origin, perhaps during the first year or two years that they come here, and also for the increasing importation of items that come from the countries in which these things occur. So I assume that we're not getting peanuts from China that have aflatoxin, but you can buy cassava here. And one of the things that we noticed through calls to the Poison Control Center was that people buy taro here and in particular people who are not of Asian origin, who eat raw taro without knowing that you shouldn't, who end up reacting to it. So I think that the increasing uh, availability of items coming from other countries means that not only do we need to think about the burden of disease associated with exposures in country of origin, but we also need to think about the importation of those items to Canada itself. Very good point. That's, that's the case. I mean. Uh, people uh, are exposed in the country of origin, and even if they are coming here, they, the diet is not changing very fast. And also, importing the, uh, impor in the food is uh, much more, could be much more toxic than the food that are available originally from here. Anyway, thanks, Reza. Very interesting talk. 
Um, actually, I had two questions. The first thing is you mentioned that there were significant exposures to dioxin in India, and I just wondered about, you know, how how they were exposed. You know, was that pesticides or what was that? And the other thing is you mentioned that there was some discussion about lead being included in this, and then it wasn't included, and I just, you know, presumably the burden of disease secondary to that is fairly significant. So is that considered, you know, in some other WHO committee that doesn't deal with food exposures? Okay. Uh, very good points. Actually, in, about the India, I'm not exactly sure uh, uh, what are the sources, but industrialization at earlier stages is uh, probably the major source for the countries who are developing very fast, such as uh, China. As for not including lead, it's a very important issue. Tom is running a study for lead and mercury in newcomers. See the study here? That will show the result, how, how, how much higher they are. Uh, you know, if, if you just look at WHO documents, it, it says that uh, getting rid of lead is probably more effective than vaccination as a whole. So when you, you cut, there, there are documents of WHO on this. Because just taking into account the lead in the use, low IQ, and the people who will push uh, below a line which uh, cannot manage themselves. So lead itself has been, I mean, there, there is an uh, independent group which, which is working on that, and the burden is probably very much. For this reason, and the lead from the food and the uh, you know, some people are spectacle for the calculation related to the lead. Uh, it was decided not to not to be taken into account. Can we, uh, Thank you. There is no other questions. I'm, I'm going to show the results of what. Have any more questions from uh, in the room? Uh, so it looks like there are no questions online either. I think. So that's it. Thank you for coming today.